everyone. Well, as you can see, I have two guests today, one who's been on the show before and one who hasn't. Um, they both are with the, the Water Wealth Project. Ian Stephen is the uh, program director there, and um, I'm not sure what April Davis does, but we'll find out. Welcome to the show, both of you. Thank you. Good Thank to you. be on. Yeah. So, okay. Ian, explain to everybody before we start the reason why you're here, um, mm -hmm. what the Water Wealth Project is. Sure, the Werewolf Project is a, a community group focused on freshwater issues, um, which is a very broad topic, everything from drinking water to the rivers and lakes. And so it covers a, a whole range of, of kind of social, political, ecological, economic issues. Um, the thing we're kind of excited to talk about today is an event that we're, we're going to be holding in September, which is a first for us for an event of this type uh, and first time we've done an event of, of this sort of scale in in years really so very happy to have a chance to chat about that today no when did uh when did you start the program uh what about start up in 2013 just the beginning of 2013 initially focused on at that what was going on at that time was modernization of bc water law um the process that resulted in the water sustainability act that we have now mm -hmm. Okay. And April, when did you become involved? Um, I got involved in, um, I think, late 2014 or 2015 uh, with stream keeping. And so what I, I got involved in that capacity and going out to a uh, for works, workshop for um, water quality testing mm -hmm. uh, with the uh, Pacific uh, stream keepers. And from there, I... Thought this is the greatest thing. Go out to the streams, get some fresh air, um, make a difference in you know checking water quality, and and so it was just yeah, it was just like a great thing. So very good. Now, Ian, back to you. So, what is this that you're all excited about? Mm -hmm. So in September, and it's kind of funny how it came about. I was out with a volunteer doing some of that stream keeping work up the Chilliwack River Valley. And mentioned that the distance from the Better Bridge at Better Crossing to Chilliwack Lake is approximately the same distance as a as a running marathon. And that volunteer said, "Salmon run." <laughs> and next thing I knew, the volunteer had this this event sort of half organized already. Um, we scaled it down. We're not doing a marathon all the way up the valley, but uh, we're going to be doing it um, along the Vetter River section, starting in Vetter Park. And it'll be a five kilometer, your choice of five kilometer or 10 kilometer walk run type event um, along the river, along the dike trail there. And there will be speakers and information and tables saying things at the at the start of the of the event. And really to um, you know bring people together on that river that is such a beautiful place and, and so so highly valued in our community. Um, you know, guests from out of town as well, runners that are interested in the run. And kind of focus our minds on on the salmon runs that come up that we get every every species of Pacific salmon come up that river yeah. and play a huge role in in the local economy with fishing and things um, and in the ecology of of the whole watershed as they do in watersheds throughout BC you can you can track the 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 size uh, of the of the salmon runs in the rings of the trees in in forests along these salmon rivers, mm -hmm. because of the nutrients that come up from the sea when the salmon are big and they come home to spawn and then they get spread throughout the forest by bears and eagles and all sorts of things. Um, you know they feed the soil and the riverbeds and and uh, the whole the whole ecology here. So there will be some some talks at the beginning of the run to kind of focus people's minds on those sorts of values and then and then do the run down this beautiful river and be thinking about how we benefit from these from these beautiful natural places and systems right so uh, april are you taking part in that yes not in the running part but i will be there um helping jamie who's is kind of oversee the the whole uh event so i'll be helping her or uh, um, helping her with that. And I would like to um, be a, just a part of this overall uh, event to get people out um, and understanding what we're what we're doing. 
Right. Now, while we're on the topic of salmon anyway, so Ian, what changes have you seen over the years as a, uh, when it comes to how many salmon come through? Yeah, well, it's, I mean, it's up and down all the time, but the trend is, is bad. Uh, the trends have been down. Um, I first started getting involved in these sorts of things while the Cohen hearings were going on in 2009, mm -hmm. or, or about the 2009 runs anyway, that were, that were the sockeye were so low that year. And the trends, you know, you see in the evidence of, that, of those hearings, the trends have been a decline for decades. And that hasn't stopped. And there's many, many factors that, that play a part of that. The other thing we're seeing, and we, our water um, testing, the stream keeping program has has kind of morphed into a climate monitoring program, which will be a you know a very long term thing to really see trends in that. But um, because we're seeing water temperatures in the Fraser and in, in the Chilliwack River, particularly the better section. Uh, temperatures in the summer are getting too hot for salmon to even survive. Um, so it, it's there's a, there's a lot to be concerned about. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Well, this question is for either of you. What is the problem? You know, when they have the um, well, all of a sudden the term has gone out of my head. Um, when they have uh, salmon that are not wild, that they got them in uh, containers and then get loose or something. You know, mm. what is the issue there? You know that's getting that's getting more into saltwater issues, which isn't isn't really Waterwell's home. Um, okay. So there are certainly other people that would speak to that better than I would. Eddie Gardner comes to mind right away as a local person, um, but it can be can compare it to feedlots like cattle feedlots. Um, you've got this dense concentration of animals, and it increases the risks of parasites and diseases. And then we've got the juvenile salmon coming out of our streams, very, very small and, and really quite vulnerable that have to migrate past these farms and past these potential sources of disease and, and, and uh, parasites. Um, okay. And it's, it has a toll on them in, the, when they're in those vulnerable young stages. Okay. Yeah, that was what I said. Salmon farms. I, I couldn't think of the term. Mm -hmm. I, I had it all in my head before I started the interview. Um, so, um, April, what what are your fears or hopes for the future when it comes to the salmon? Um, I, my kind of focus is kind of the awareness. And I think if more people uh, become more aware of the importance, um, that they'll have an understanding with regards to the salmon that uh, basically if the salmon and we don't take care of their habitat, mm. we're not taking care of our habitat. And so our journey for as humans going on is going to be way, going to be incredibly difficult for a lot of us or our kids and our grandkids, because everybody is, is more aware that the temperatures are going up right. and it's affecting how we live now. So, right. So Ian, I, I'm thinking about, we have two factors, right? The increase in water temperature and so many more human beings fishing for the salmon, and, and I'm not talking about the individual fishermen, obviously, but those uh, big trawlers that go in and, and just scoop them all up, right? Yeah, um, and that that gets incredibly complex because even in the freshwater, you've, you've got uh, indig indigenous fisheries. I mean, we have unextinguished indigenous title here in, in BC and, and Culturally, ecologically, or economically, salmon have have been extremely important to First Nations, um, and and so their fishing rights really should be primary, I believe. Um, particularly, uh, you know, at the very least, the ceremonial fisheries, and 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 we've seen instances of of indigenous chiefs arrested for catching a ceremonial salmon. Um, and then, and then add on top of that, the, you've got the recreational fisheries, which are range from the professionals who, who you know, it's a, it's a, an important industry to the recreation. There's so many thousands of people that that's a very important source of recreation for them. And somehow in that, you have to manage a declining stock of fish to, to fish from. And then out into the ocean, you're dealing with international issues because you know, the salmon do kind of circuits up through, so they're going into Alaska, Russian waters, international waters, 
And so the management become, management becomes very, very complex. Um, and I think everybody wants conservation to be kind of top of mind and first priority, but it, it seems like it doesn't end up working out that way yeah. in, in the results. Uh, it's, it's so complex. Yeah, I, I can imagine like, like one country and another country, like if, if Canada just, Canada say, the Canadian government decided uh, fishers are really going to make a big impact and and um, be more aware and be more careful, whatever. If they don't have those agreements with other countries, it doesn't mean anything, really, does it? Yeah, yeah. The international agreements are essential, um, and there is a salmon commission between Canada and the U.S. that that works on those agreements. Um, but you still see concerns. There's been concerns raised recently in the media about salmon, too many salmon being taken in Alaska and not enough of them making down and making their way down into Canadian waters. Yeah. And unfortunately they have to come this way. <laughs> so what mm -hmm. do you do? Yeah. 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 A lot of negotiation. And I mean, everybody, the, the science is, is critical to know what's going on out in the ocean what's going on in the, in the, in the freshwater, you know, as far as like where water wealth works in the freshwater sort of realm, um, habitat mm -hmm. degradation and loss is, is an ongoing problem um, that is, I think, a significant factor in in the well-being of for the spawners to be able to survive to spawn, and then for those juveniles to be able to survive to get out again. Um, you know, if you look at coho that might live in fresh water for up to a couple of years before they head out, yeah. they're extremely susceptible to to contaminants like the the chemicals that come out of tires from our cars. Uh, so in an urban area like Chilliwack, where you've got roads intersecting salmon streams, you know, uh, these are these are complex and serious issues that need to be dealt with. Right. Now, so, now the, is the the Water Wealth Project, is that just local? Well, it's a, it's a, we're a local group, but, but we, so. you know, are often dealing with, like we did with the Water Sustainability Act, dealing with provincial and, and even federal issues. Um Something that's been taking up far too much of my time for years now has been the Trans Mountain Project, which is a federal project. So it's kind of all over. It's everything from local to to uh, to national, even touching little bits on international. Okay. So April, when you're out there testing water, water quality, what is it you're looking for? Um, one of the biggest things is oxygen to see if there's enough oxygen in the water for um, salmon. So that's one of the biggest things. When we um, go out there, we test for pH, acidity, as well as um, conductivity and saline. So it's kind of a mixture. We, if the stream is, um, if we're able to, uh, we start to check the depths banks and um, that sort of stuff. It just depends on how large and how much time we have to do that part and the temperatures. I don't know whether, um, you know, we have a program where we have 33 temperature loggers that are up in the Chilliwack River Valley in, in, the, in the streams. Mm -hmm. and, and that started a couple, I think, what, three years ago. Um, so we've got that program going where where we've got uh, the temperature loggers and Ian's got a bit more of the details on the actual um, logger that we do use. Now, every year, uh, every summer in Chilliwack's the same thing about water uh, conversation, uh, conversa conservation. <laughs> Sorry. If I wanted to wa water my lawn, which I don't do, I think it's ridiculous, but anyway, um, if I wanted to water, I have certain you know restrictions because of, of the water levels. It's the same thing every year. Is there something that can be done about that to change so that there, we're not short of water? Oh, um, or is that, is, that, is that something you look into? Maybe you don't even go there. Well, well, we do. I'm just trying to think like what's going to be done. I mean, we're, we're, you've got a limited and actually declining source of water. For those of us who, who live here in Chilliwack, um, then April touched earlier on that the sort of the relationship of our well-being to the to the well-being of these natural places. Mm -hmm. This Chilliwack River comes 
comes down the Chilliwack River Valley and it turns at Vetter Crossing and runs runs uh, west as the Vetter River. The name changes at that at that turn, and there it's also flowing into the ground. And and people in Chilliwack probably know we get our drinking water from city wells. Mm-hmm. Most of us. Uh, and those wells get their water from the Sardis Better Aquifer. I think a lot of people don't realize that the main source of recharge to that Sardis Better Aquifer is that river. Right. So, you know, for example, our, our we know our own bodies are largely made up of water. The water, if you live in Chilliwack, the water that's in your cells, uh, to a large degree, probably came from that river because it's flowing down the river into the ground, mm-hmm. recharging that aquifer that your drinking water is coming from. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. And the river with climate change, the flows are declining and the, the glaciers at the very top of it are declining right. while our population is growing. Yes, right. So we're going to have to pay attention to that sort of conservation more and more going into the future. It's hard to get people to to really pay attention. I think it's hard. Uh, I don't know if it's individuals. It's more uh, maybe big business. I don't know, you know, but um, and getting governments on board and really getting strict. I mm-hmm. think it would be the only solution that I can think of. And when it comes to watering, I just want to tell people like, why do you worry about a lawn? You know, it'll go, it'll go brown. And, and the minute we start getting some rain, it's all green again. <laughs> so mm-hmm. it's like, why would you possibly worry about it? It makes zero sense to me, you know? <laughs> mm-hmm. I'd agree, yeah. That what is more precious for other things <laughs> than your lawn? <laughs> Plant the tree. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, plant other I, I, kinds of cover. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. You can yeah. I think, so sorry, I, I was I was hoping that this kind of thing where it brought a lot of different um groups of people. You know, this event, the salmon run, yes. that uh with the people that are going to be speaking and the people that are have tables and vendors, that they'll have more of a sense of, you know, we're really connected. And if we uh, we are going to have to start to choose um, what's important is our drinking water and, and those kind of things before the aesthetics of a lawn or those kind of things. So we, I think we have to really change our mindset and this might be an opportunity for some of the people in Chilak to bring it to whoever they talk to after that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I interviewed somebody with the, the, the called a gorilla, gorilla, gorilla gardener. And they're about, uh, you know, planting, like you said, ground cover or, or strawberries or something, you know, that you can eat or, you know, harvest in some way, right, rather than uh, a lawn. Anyway, I'm off the topic. I know that. So, Ian, just remind people when the event is taking place, where? Mm-hmm. Yeah, September 24th. Um, <laughs> I've forgotten the exact start time, but it's on our website and you'll see it in the social media that we put out and stuff. Um 10 o'clock comes to mind. April maybe can correct me on that. Okay. Starting at Better Park, which is where the dog park is by the Better Bridge, on, yeah. uh, and it'll go along the dike trail down Better River, September 24th. Okay. And people who register this month um, get included in their registration and event t-shirt as well. And then those t-shirts will be on sale at the event as well. Okay, great. And um, I will look up your website. I just put the, the Water Well Project on the website. It will come up, right? Because I want to include that. Yeah, waterwealthproject.com. Okay, yeah. great. All right, well, thank you, you two, for, for uh, doing this. I really appreciate it. Just stay on camera for a second. Um, so uh, this is to the audience out there. Like, I hope you really listen and, and maybe go to this event and learn more about the salmon. The, the food is important to all of us, and um, we can't be wasteful, and we certainly shouldn't be greedy. So um, on that note, um, be nice, everybody, and uh, peace out. <laughs> A sense of community, till the wax a place to be. A sense of community when you're free. Rolling through the mountains, rolling through the valley, rolling through paradise with me. It's multicultural, you're sure to see it all. Till the wax a place to be, you'll see. Come party in the park, go dancing after dark, chill a wax a place to be, you'll see.